All right, so welcome back to this episode of AI here at NYU. Uh, we are starting now the second uh, part of the semester, the second, yeah, the second part. But then since we we would like to remind ourselves what we cover in this first part, we're going to be starting with a, a small recap such that we are all on the same page and then we can uh, move forward together to the new topics uh, that we're going to be covering now. So the idea actually was to, um, uh, if I talk to my mom about AI, what is the example I talked about uh, to her these days, right? I mean, to my mom or any kid I find. Uh, I think the most obvious, uh, uh, well, and recent uh, example is would be the chat GPT or these chatbots that are somehow sort of intelligent. Uh, I mean, sort of, because we, we see why is that the case uh, very soon. Uh, they, they seem like at least to be able to communicate in natural language. So eventually, the second at the end of the second part of the course, we're going to be talking about natural language processing and specifically about how these uh, chatbots are trained, how what's inside, how we can actually get something uh, like a computer to create these things. Uh, to get there, we have to do some work before, which is going to be learning about learning. How do we uh, get a model to acquire knowledge? Uh, from the world, from observation of uh, examples. And so to get there, we're going to be actually starting one step even back and then figuring out where we are in our course and then how we may move forward. Moreover, I, would, I want to say something. Since, since this is my first time teaching uh, with you guys, uh, every time you have no idea what I'm saying and what's going on, it's very likely my fault. It's the first time I'm teaching this course here. And so I don't know you. I don't know this topic. Uh, I, I I know the topics. I mean, hopefully I know something, but I haven't given these lectures before to undergraduates. So every time you have no idea what's going on, my accent is too strong, it's too thick. I'm saying gibberish, right? Just stop me just type in the chat. Uh, I have a chat open all the time here on my side. Uh, every time you have no idea what's going on, type in the chat, what's going on? What are you talking about? I can repeat myself as many times as you need, as long as it's, you know, uh, with some purpose, right? Such that we can understand what's going on. If you understand what's going on, type something in the chat such that I can see you understand what's going on. Type in the chat something. Yes. Okay. Very good. I like, I like the exclamation points. That, that's a good uh, spirit. All right. Okay, sweet. Okay, you, you know how to use the keyboard. That's great. All right. So I will always uh, look at the chat in order to be gouging myself and understanding whether I'm making a good job communicating or I'm very bad at communicating with you. Uh, we are not in person, so I cannot come there and shake you uh, physically, but, nor that I should do it, but you know, we never know. Uh, I will try to entertain as much as I can. But again, you are supposed to be kind of uh, paying attention. If it's my fault, please stop me. I will repeat again anything you need. That said, let's get started with a recap of what we cover so far, such that we can get started by, uh, you know, <laughs> all together in the same point. So what is this artificial intelligence? Why are we talking about this stuff? So artificial intelligence is the study of rational behavior. Uh, that guides possibly the creation of an intelligent machine. That is our final purpose. Um, we can see this as uh, two types of discipline. Uh, we it can be also uh, can be seen as an engineering discipline because it's concerned with the concept theory and practice of building some actual machine. So we are actually the engineers behind, but also can be uh, thought as a science such that uh, we are trying to, uh, if we have some working uh, machine, then we can actually maybe make connection on how our mind works. And so we are going to develop some concept vocabulary to help us understand intelligent behavior. Uh, this was my first time covering the uh, pre predicate calculus. I never seen that before. And I, I think it's beautiful. I've been reading this book uh, that is here cited on the on the bottom side, Genezareth and Nilsson from 1987, quite a long time ago. Uh, and I, I believe that it's fascinating. I've been reading it and I love it. And it again, somehow I think it might reflect how our internal process of thinking works. And that's why I can see uh, so many researchers were pursuing this uh, this path back uh, back in the days. Thank you, Ernie, for recommending this book. 
Then we started the course talking about problem solving agents. What are these agents? These are the most simple type of agent uh, we talk about. And they are basically uh, searching for a solution uh, that among atomic states, meaning there are states that we cannot really uh, break them apart. We just have a specific state. And we can search a for, for a solution through a sequence of actions. So basically we are kind of planning a way through this thing. Uh, so this is actually also uh, an instance of classical planning. Uh, these are not called planning agent because planning agents are something that use some factor or structure representation instead. But again, we don't cover them, so it doesn't really matter. But this is like a most simple case of planning. Um, and then we saw there are two types. We had the informed or the uninformed. The uninformed also is known as the blind search. And the informed one is also called uh, heuristic search. So there are two types and they are based on the availability or lack of this heuristic function that is guiding us towards the solution. Again, uh, there, if there are questions, ask questions, but this is just a recap of what, what we cover. Uh, then we actually move towards something that is, again, su super fascinating, in my opinion, which is this inference with a knowledge-based agent. What is this knowledge-based agent? So basically, we provide some statements, which is creating the knowledge that this system has. For example, uh, all humans are mortal. So for every X, X is a human. Therefore, uh, X is also mortal. And then another statement could be, for example, all philosophers are humans. So for every X, X is a philosopher. Therefore, if it's a philosopher, X is also a human. And the final statement, the third one, I guess you might know what, uh, what's coming. Uh, Socrates is a philosopher. So we have the uh, relation here, the, the, the proposition that Socrates is a philosopher. And so now my question would be, what is the outcome if you put all this together? Now is a question for you to type the answer in the in the chat. That's the, the quiz part uh, of the class. What what the, what is the conclusion you can take? Uh, the obvious conclusion from these three premises. Yeah. So Socrates is mortal, right? Socrates is a human, therefore a mortal. That, that's great. Good. Right. So here I I, I type this. KB means um, knowledge base, which is again this kind of bucket of all the information we have available. And in this case, it's going to be the conjunction, the end of these three statements. And therefore, that means the logical implication, Socrates is mortal. All right, so one more of these things just for, for, for fun. Uh, how about the following? Uh, brothers and sisters, I have none, but that man's father is my father's son. Who's that man? <laughs> I know I'm a bit funny. I know it's morning and not everyone is yet. No, that's not you, Tony. Uh, read again, right? That who's that man? That man's father is my father's son. Who's that man? It cannot be myself. I'm pointing to that point to that man's there, right? Yeah, that you're correct, uh, Jashan. Okay, let's move forward. That was a, a quick, uh, nice uh, thing to play with. Anyway, moving forward. Um, then we actually start talking about uncertainty. Why did we start talking about uncertainty? Uh, we start talking about uncertainty because uh, the agent might not know uh, some facts. Uh, so the agent has only a degree of belief in a specific statement. It doesn't mean the statement is partially true or partially false. That, that would be fuzzy, fuzzy logic. Uh, this is, again, probability uh, refers to the degree of knowledge that a agent has uh, for a specific, again, statement. So how does it work? Uh, for example, we could possibly think if we are borrowing the thing from the, like the symbols from the previous slide, uh, that the tooth, if I have a toothache, then I have a cavity, which is wrong, right? Because if I have a toothache, doesn't necessarily mean I have a cavity, right? I could have a cavity, but also I could not. So this statement, it's wrong, right? I, I think you all, all can agree. So if I have a toothache, uh, I could have a cavity or gingivitis or an abscess or all these things. So the point here is that I have to enumerate all possible causes that could be creating this um, toothache. And so again, by if I will not be exhaustive, then it's not going to be correct uh, again. How about flipping the, the, the arrow? Like how about saying, oh, if I have a cavity, therefore it will hurt. 
Well, not necessarily. You have a cavity, you don't know, you go to the dentist, it's going to tell you, oh, you have a cavity. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. It didn't hurt. Well, too bad. I mean, <laughs> so it doesn't work. You understand, right? Both implications are broken. The implication that would work would be the one with the full uh, uh, ORs, right? The whole the whole list of all possible causes. I can't list all of them. So I cannot really express this type of relationship. So then are we because we have some sort of either lack of knowledge in this case, because there are infinite way of, infinite possibility or some specific relation doesn't really necessarily always hold. And so how do we fix this? We introduce the, uh, I mean, there is some uncertainty. We can, uh, we can introduce the uncertainty over the uh, possible statement. And therefore we can have this new type of uh, statement in this case, if I go to a periodic dentist checkup, then I will have this probability of having a cavity, uh, which is 0.2. So I use this notation, the lower case cavity means cavity is true. Okay, this is the same, the same notation your uh, our textbook uses. So capital cavity, capital C cavity is the random variable. It can take true or false. When capital cavity, like the random variable cavity takes true, we can just state the lowercase uh, name, okay? If it's gonna be the false, uh, we can put the negation in front of cavity, lowercase cavity. Again, here the notation I told you before is that the lowercase variable uh, means the uppercase, the random variable that is uppercase, it's actually true. The not lowercase uh, version is gonna be uh, saying that is uh, the random variable is actually false, okay? Again, this is the notation we use in the textbook, so I, I think it's pretty nice, it's compact. So again, I go to the dentist uh, checkup and then I might have a cavity 0.2 probability, 20%. So it's the degree of belief of how likely I could have a cavity. I don't have this knowledge, I just have the belief. On the other side, uh, if he actually hurts, well, now my degree of belief, well, it went up a lot, right? From 0.2 to 0.6. This is because I have some evidence, right? I have partial information. Before I didn't know anything. So that was my prior before knowing, right? Prior before. Now that I know something that it hurts, damn, then I can actually uh, have a higher degree of belief uh, that I might, might have a cavity. So, so far, everything good, right? No, 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 nothing, no, no new stuff. And just, again, just tell me if you don't know what's going on. Um, all right, last two slides for this in the review. Probabilistic inference, so what is this stuff? So the, before we saw how we perform inference in a knowledge base, uh, with a knowledge ba base agent, now let's have a look how we perform inference with a probabilistic agent. So we would like to compute the posterior probability. And the posterior is another word in this case for conditional. You can see this at the bottom of the screen for a query proposition. Okay, so we have a question, we have a query, and then we want to compute what is the uh, specific uh, posterior probability for that specific uh, question we have. Uh, why is a conditional probability? Because if I have some evidence, I definitely want to take the a conditional probability. If I have no evidence, I have no knowledge, then I can take, uh, we consider the prior, which is again, this kind of degree of belief about the query without having any knowledge. Given that I have partial information, therefore I would like to compute the posterior, meaning I'd like to uh, conditionalize, make, make it a conditional such that I have the best, uh, best guess, right? The best information out of it. Uh, where where do we do these computations? We do all of these uh, computations, right? The, the conditional and so on. Also, we can get the prior out of the full joint distribution. So this full joint distribution is going to be the probability distribution that is telling us how all these variables uh, basically interact with each other. And we can think about this as being the acting as the knowledge base. So this full joint probability distribution is the basically uh, knowledge that the system has about all the possible variables. And then from this whole uh, full joint, we can, for example, sum uh, all the different values for a specific variable to marginalize it, 
uh, we can divide something in order to get conditional probabilities and so on. Okay, we're going to be seeing actually today uh, how to do to do this for a specific case um, of learning. Okay. Uh, Finally, some definitions, because we want to be sure we know what we are talking about. The prior, again, is the degree of belief in the absence of any other information. So prior is going to be, it means, prior means before in Latin. I don't know if it also works in English. Before having observed anything. So what is the probability that your tooth has a cavity, right? You don't know anything else. Just your degree of belief. Uh, then the evidence of what we actually have. We have partial information. Again, it hurts. We don't know if it's a cavity, but no, you know it hurts. So evidence is, again, the knowledge that we obtain, the partial knowledge we obtain. If we have the whole knowledge, then there is no more probability. It's going to be deterministic, either one or zero. Boolean, again, the yeah. proposition. Uh, finally, we have the last uh, definition here, which is the posterior which is my updated degree of belief, given that I have obtained the evidence, right? So I had the prior belief, I see something, now I change my opinion. And now I will state something in uh, that might be, uh, you know, debatable, which is the following. Possibly we can think about this update uh, of prior knowledge through experiencing something as learning, right? If you're changing your belief, uh, given that you experienced something, then you learned something out of it, right? Perhaps. So I guess this is the, the first type of learning uh, I would possibly claim. Okay. All right. Uh, so what is learning? So learning, basically, uh, I can think about it as being like some sort of long-term memory, like something that I have internalized rather than like short work uh, work in memory that I'm just using as a cache, right? Something I knew I need to uh, use it for 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 thinking on the spot. I can also think about learning as improving performance through experience. So I I have some sort of uh, we had to introduce some sort of like um, performance evaluation, and then if I improve over time. I improve over performing the specific task. Like I've been playing guitar all night, all my fingers are hurting, but then I'm getting better and better, hopefully, right? Uh, maybe I play for you at the end of the class of the semester. So again, if you improve over time, maybe you're, you're learning something, right? I guess you do. Uh, finally, another one would be, uh, that is a bit you know, more technical, I guess, is that the knowledge base is populated by induction uh, rather than deductions. If you have your axioms, right, your statements initially, uh, if you have a sound inference process, you can create more uh, statements. You can enlarge your overall set of, uh, again, uh, in, in knowledge you have. Whereas in a machine learning case, you basically populate your knowledge through observations of uh, multiple instances of the same thing right so if you see uh, always the the yellow bus of the, the school bus right moving in front of you at eight uh, you will basically learn that there is a school bus coming there and then maybe all school bus are yellow right because that's what you you saw you cannot you don't necessarily generalize you see one day a school bus that is green oh that's not a school bus you, you never seen it before so you learn just by basically uh, again, induction. You you saw it once, twice, thrice. Then okay, maybe that's that's true, but you don't really reason about it, right? You just kind of acquire this information somehow. Again, I I hope uh, it makes sense. Okay, so getting closer to today's topic uh, of the lesson, I haven't even told you what we talk about. So let me get there with two more slides, and then we start actually today's uh, lesson. Yes, it's going to be about learning what type of algorithm I tell you now. So since we talk about this probabilistic uh, inference, let's actually get down to a specific case. In this case, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Bayes rule. Why do we, are we talking about this? This is very, really powerful uh, thing, right? I mean, I, when I saw it, oh, just a question. Why, why is it powerful? OK, because it means more than just uh, symbols okay so there is some semantics coming out of this specific statement it's not just the syntax right when i sometimes i see a question so i'm like sure what what what's what's with it but then there is more uh, to it let, let, let's go through this 
So this rule basically uh, allows us to invert the causal direction to the diagnostic direction. What does this mean? Big words, right? They are also bigger because they are bold. All right. So in the on the bottom side of the slide, I just gave you the definitions for now. So the causal direction means there is some sort of cause. Uh, you're, 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 you have a cavity and then you may have an effect. It hurts or might not. Right. So both cause and effect are uh, random variable. Uh, in this case, cause is lowercase. Uh, because it means uh, I actually observe, uh, well, I actually have, uh, I, have the, I do have the cavity. And then the effect in lowercase means I do, uh, I do observe in this case uh, uh, that it is hurting. So given the cause, then I may have an effect. The diagnostic direction, which is instead what you ask your uh, physician whenever you, you, you feel not okay. So you feel some symptoms, right? You have some effects. You would like to figure out wh why, right? What is the cause that is uh, bring like what is the cause that generated those effects? Uh, this is the diagnostic direction, meaning uh, you don't know what you have. Uh, if you knew, you would be at least uh, more, you know, chill about it. You observe some symptoms. You'd like to figure out what are the causes, and this is the. Uh, diagnostic direction, the flipped one. And the interesting bit is that this causal direction and diagnostic direction are tied together uh, by the laws of probability. And you can just take some uh, ratios and you get one after the other. And so again, I, I never kind of figure out what is the re relevance of doing this. But then again, you, if you actually think about the case, then you actually can say see how this is actually important. Like mathematically, these two the things are related, although like reasoning about it without having the math, uh, maybe you cannot really tell, right? So it, I think there are some studies that show that uh, humans are not very good at uh, intuitive base rule. They always get, uh, they, they get really off uh, in terms of like reasoning about this. So are we actually rational agents? Hmm. Are humans rational? I mean, somehow, right? So some, someone more, someone less. But anyway, moving forward. Important questions anyway. I hope you enjoy. All right. So uh, second part is going to be the evidence, right? The evidence is the, the whatever I observe is, in this case, the effect. Uh, I have some effects and the query would be, oh, what caused it, right? I'm asking a question about the, the cause. So we switch words, right? Before we had prior evidence and query, uh, I think. And there also there was a posterior somewhere. And then now we are switching terms to the ev evidence is the effect. So if the effect is the evidence and the cause is our query, the question. Okay, so base rule, we, we all know, I think, but let's, let's see again, right? So here we have the uh, probability of the cause given that I observed the effect. So the, the diagnostic uh, direction, it, it's equal the uh, causal direction, the probability of the effect given the cause when multiplied by the uh, prior of the cause. So the numerator basically is the joint probability. And then I divide by the probability of the effect. How do I get the probability of the effect? Well, that one I can actually compute it uh, by marginalization of the joint. So if you can see here, the uh, expression is just computing the uh, joint for the uh, effect given the cause happen, and then the probability with the um, joined with the with the cause that didn't happen and then you multiply the two so you have the joint for the case it, it, it happened the case it didn't uh, happen and then if you sum them up you will automatically get just the probability of the effect all right so then you can just revert now this uh basically probability but the point is that it gives you knowledge uh, so we perform inference, right? We had some initial statements, some initial probability, some, I guess, joint. And then we do some reasoning, basically, in order to come up with a new degree, new belief that we can actually compute uh, numerically. And we're going to be doing this uh, quite a bit today. And I'm glad someone got it. <laughs> All right, so one more uh, thing. We're going to be talking today about the following. Okay, so given that we are kind of uh, understanding what's going on, uh, we're going to be talking about naive Bayes. What is naive Bayes? Uh, so naive Bayes simply is uh, can be condensed in the following statement. 
he assumes conditional independence of the effects given the cause. What does it mean? So if I have a specific, uh, like something happened, therefore all the effects are just all independent. And therefore, given the uh, something has happened, again, all of them are independent. And this allows us to simplify a lot uh, computations as well. So the, the following is the basically mathematical version of this statement. Uh, and naive Bayes simply states that the joint probability, so this P that is governing the interaction of this random variable, the cause, the first effect, second, third, blah, 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 until the nth uh, effect is going to be the prior for the cause that we can uh, we can get. And then we can just multiply all the um, conditional probabilities. So given that we observe the cause, that given that we have the cause, then we can simply, uh, again, multiply all together these um, effects. And in this case, we have the joint, okay? What would be the correct way of expanding a joint probability through uh, its internal parts, right? We, we, are, we know about chain rule, do we? Chain rule of probability, we covered it in class. Yes, right? So the correct way to, to actually write down this one would be the following. So if you have this joint over three uh, random variable, the cause, effect one, effect two, I can put a bar on the on the left hand side here and I put E2 and C on the right hand side and then I multiply by these two things right so if you multiply these two together you're gonna get back the joint and then you take this joint here you can split this joint again you put a bar here you multiply the probability of the thing that goes to the right hand side you see you put a bar two things on the right and the two things on the right pop out I put a bar here the thing on the right pops out, right? So this is how this chain rule works for probabilities. Uh, now, Bayes simply says this effect, you can remove it. The probability of uh, the effect one is independent of the effect two, given that you observed the actual cause. And therefore, the final expression would be the multiplication of all these probabilities, uh which only have the c the cause on the right side of the bar of the conditional bar and then you have all these effects e1 e2 e3 blah 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 until en and then finally you multiply everything by the prior and this gives you the joint probability what do we use the joint probability for the full joint probability we call it before for our uh probabilistic uh agent is corresponding to what with the non-probabilistic agent? Uh, what, what is the relationship? What is the connection between the full joint and those uh, knowledge-based agents? It was in two slides ago. Were you paying attention? Question to the students. Do I have to go back? <laughs> students, <laughs> you can say, we don't know. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Just type something unless, okay. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Why do I want to compute the full joint probability? Why do I care about the first line? Why do I want to know what is this joint probability? If we have the joint probability, then I can do what? Everything. I can compute marginal. I can compute conditionals. I can, can compute... Uh, priors, I can compute anything I want, right? So if I have the full joint probability, I can compute all uh, those surrogates, those kind of uh, output kind of things, right? Uh, it, ta it, takes, it tells me everything I need to know. And so if we want to make an analogy uh, with, this, with the knowledge base agent we have seen before, what is this full joint uh, probability corresponding to for a knowledge base agent? No one takes it, taking notes. <laughs> the effect, no. Okay, let me go back. See, that's why we have a chat, such that I can see whether it makes sense or not. So here we saw this one, right? So the knowledge base was the, uh, basically all the knowledge we had. It was the, the three different statements. If you take the whole set of statements that the entire knowledge my system has. 
And then we cover here, the, on this slide here, when we talk about probabilistic agents, we said that we're going to be computing something like posterior from uh, giving some evidence from the full joint. And then the full joint acts as our knowledge base, our KB. Okay. So the full joint distribution is this mathematical uh, you know, function, if you want to call it, that is allowing us to ask all possible questions. And so the full joint acts as the entire knowledge that the, our agent has. So if we want to make any type of questions, again, for a posterior, for prior, for uh, conditionals, for marginalization, anything you want to ask, right? Every type of probability we want to compute is going to be a derivative not the derivative in mathematical sense, like something that is de derived from the full joint, right? The full joint is the entire knowledge that we have. Then given this full knowledge, we can perform inference, probabilistic inference, right? We can ask any question we want. We can ask any question if we have the full joint. Until here, are you following? I know it's a lot, but I'm trying my best. Yes, so... Nashra is following. Lina is following also Michael. Okay. Okay. If you don't follow, complain. Because again, it's the first time I'm teaching these things, right? And if it doesn't make sense, I, it's my bad because I don't know how to express myself. What is the full joint uh, distribution? So full joint distribution. We saw, uh, I would recommend checking out chapter 12 of, the, uh, of our textbook. But again, basically it tells you the full joint is going to be the probability uh, for all the possible variables. In this case here on the last slide, the full joint would be the first statement here. I have it in the, in the, on the slide. Okay. This one here tells you how all these variables interact with each other. Given that you have this full joint, then we can compute anything we want. And today we're going to see some example of this. The interesting thing, naive base just tells us how to compute this uh, full joint in this specific case, when we have one cause that generates multiple independent effects. Does it make sense? You can say yes, does it make sense? No, we see, we're gonna see an example of this uh, naive base. But the point was, why are, we ask, why are we computing this full joint? Full joint allows us to ask any question about the specific problem or any problem we want, okay? And the nice part here is the fact that we, uh, remove every uh, evidence on from the right side of the conditional bar. Moving forward, let's figure out how this naive base works. And again, since I never taught this before, I didn't have slides about this. Therefore, I asked my colleagues in uh, uh, Berkeley to lend me their slides. And so Basically, Peter Abil was so kind to uh, lend me his slides. Okay, so these are all the authors of these slides. I, I changed them a little bit, but <clears throat> most most of the of the slides are actually from them. Uh, so we're gonna be talking again. We said about uh, ba base uh, naive base to perform classification. So in this specific case, we are we would like to train an agent to be able to tell apart um, spam. Or ham, right? If you have email inbox, you're gonna have a lot of spam. Usually, I, do, I have a lot of spam, too much spam. But I'd like to create an, an agent that is learning uh, through experience to improve his performance in classifying uh, good emails from bad emails. Okay. Uh, usually, I, I, I select everything to spam. That's why if you write me an email, it's likely going to spam. Write me on Campus Fire if you need anything. Okay. Or just okay. I'm just kidding. All right, so let, let's figure out this together. The first email I get is the following. Dear sir, sir first, I must solicit uh, your confidence in this transaction. This is by virtue of its nature as being utterly confidential. Okay, what do you think? Is the first case uh, spam or ham? It's ham? <laughs> do you know the meaning of ham, right? I mean, ham, the, not the thing you eat, right? Okay, this is spam for sure. All right, sweet. So that I would like my my agent to classify the first one as being uh, uh, as being like not not proper. All right, let's figure out the second one. Uh, everything capital. So this guy is shouting. 
Uh, to be removed from future mailings, simply reply to this message and put remove in the subject. 99 million email addresses uh, for only $99. Okay, everyone type spam. I understand we are okay. I kind of agree on, on this one, fine. And how about the last one? Oh, I know this is bluntly uh, off topic, but I beginning to go insane. And an old Dell Dimension XPS sitting in the corner depends, right? So if you are actually uh, in the in the tech world, this actually is a is a is a is actually a, a, a ham, right? It's actually a good email. Although again, there is a lot of terminology. I guess is is context dependent, right? Okay, this is a good one. So in this case, we have this large, uh, why the first one is spam though? Uh, the first one, because it's super uh, utterly confidential and top secret, and they must solicit my confidence in this specific transaction. I, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like, dear sir, there is no name in the subject. <laughs> I mean, up to you, I, I guess. All right. <laughs> Moving forward, I was saying setup. So how do we get to, to, to build this agent that is learning from this evidence? Uh, so we get a large collection of examples email. Uh, each of them are labeled either spam or ham. Um, someone actually has to label uh, all of this data. And this is actually very, very expensive. Uh, we will learn later on in the course uh, how we can avoid doing this uh, huge uh, labeling. And that's going to be called self-supervised learning. And that is actually how we train these uh, chatbots, to be honest. Uh, otherwise, no one has that many labels to, to train these models. Uh, so we would like to learn to predict labels of new future emails. Cool. So the features are the following in our case. The attributes used for making uh, to make the decision between ham and spam. OK, for example, word free. Right? Oh, you have free something right? that, that may be uh, indicative of being a spam or text pattern. Right. If you know where I get it, a dollar sign DD meaning like a dollar uh, like dollar amount and dd means two digit uh integers or maybe using cap locks right if you're shouting why are you shouting don't shout in the email right uh other examples uh, could be like in the header of the email if you check the original message even in a in a even uh, with gmail you can check the original message you see the whole uh, uh header for example, you can see whether the sender is in your contacts or you can see which server sent the email. Uh, we can see whether it was widely broadcast and so on. Okay, So we're going to be using these as features for figuring out whether this uh, specific future email it actually should be classified as spam or ham. Another example uh, would be the following. So it's no longer binary classification. In this case, it's going to be a 10-way uh, classification from images, uh, like a grid of pixels that are basically uh, how your, your images are encoded, uh, that are going uh, representing digits from 0 to 9. So we have 10 uh, options. Again, we have to collect this large collection of examples, uh, each label with a digit. Someone again has to label these things. So this is actually one of the major uh, problems in in industry: uh, labeling. Right? How do you label things? H how do you label things? Question to you: <laughs> Do we know what labeling means? Yeah, manually. But who 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 does this manually? Right? Someone has to do these things, right? And. <laughs> so uh, yeah, most most likely a, a, a human, right? And humans cost, right? You have to employ someone. Uh, you can use Amazon Turk and so on. Uh, and this is usually like data collection is a one of the major problems you will actually face if you actually work in machine learning uh, for for real. Anyway, so this is a major problem. That's why we've uh, been working on different type of algorithms that don't really uh, require a that much annotated data. Again, so we want to learn uh, to predict new labels, uh, like labels for new future digit images. So for example, the first one here looks like, um, OK, now, yeah, the pictures, the picture here represents how these uh, digits are encoded. So we have like a grid. Each, uh, each square is called a pixel, uh, which means picture element. And it can either be, in this case, white or black. So let, let's consider it to be Boolean, right? Binary. So we're going to be looking at specific features uh, 
For example, if the Pixel 6 8 is going to be either on or off. Okay, so these are pretty much the relevant features for determining whether this is a specific, you know, uh, whatever whatever digit this is. Another possible way to go would be like uh, checking how many are the uh, ind independent components in the, like how many blobs do I see? What is the aspect ratio of the black uh, area? How many loops? Maybe if I have two loops, it's an eight or something, right? I have a one loop, it's a, it's a six possibly, or a nine, uh, and so on. So also, let, let's see what these numbers could be, right? So on the top right-hand side, we have possibly a zero. Then we might have a one here. I guess it's a two. Then it's a one. And that thing, I don't know, it looks like a flipped six. I'm not sure. So also there is some sort of like ambiguity, right? Because these pictures are handwritten. So again, depending on how good you are at writing, some of the things are a bit hard to figure out. Other classification examples, right? Why are we talking about this? I guess everything can be turned into a classification problem and it's one of the most, again, uh, important tools we have in machine learning. So the, the overall point is the following. Given a input X, we would like to predict a class label Y, okay? So uh, given my X, uh, in this case, before we saw that it was an email uh, text for the X or the X was uh, an image for the digits, right? And all the, the pixels and the Y were either spam or ham. On the other case was one of the 10 possible digits. Other examples would be, again, we saw just this one before. OCR, we have an input image. You try to figure out what character you're actually looking at. In other cases, we may have medical diagnosis. Given we have symptoms, we would like to figure out what are the uh, disease, like that's basically what we were talking about before with the diagnostic direction of the conditional probability. Uh, for example, uh, <laughs> for example, we would like to uh, automatically grade uh, your assignments such that we don't have to uh, bother too much the, the graders um, or make like fraud detection. But I guess for fraud detection, I would use something else rather than classification because we don't really have too many examples, negative examples. Um, all right. So yeah, again, the slides are from 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 Berkeley. Uh, my my slides are the black ones, <laughs> the boring one. Anyway, uh, we may have also the customer service email routing, right? You try to figure out who you want to talk to, contact. We ha have automatic automatically routing to the specific expert. Uh, <laughs> all right. So classification is again is an important commercial uh, commercial technology. So back to our first case, we'd like to figure out which one are spam and which one are ham. Okay, so we have our uh, specific problem at hand. So we're going to be considering now a model-based approach. What do I mean by model-based approach? We are building a model, like I showed you in the, in the previous uh, deck of slides, where we're going to be creating this model that is governing all those uh, random variables, which is the full joint probability. So we're going to be building this model, this probabilistic model, uh, where both the labels and features are the random variable, full. Uh, we instantiate any observed feature, as in we are going to be pointing out what, how to collect these features. And then we're going to be querying for the distribution of the label condition on the feature. So given that we observe this specific email, like which has specific uh, characteristics, we're going to try to do the diagnostic thing, right? How do we do the, the diagnostic? How do we flip the probability with, we, we learned this in the previous deck of slide, type in the chat. How do we flip the uh, probability, the conditional probability from the causal to the diagnostic base rule. Very good. Okay, good. All right, sweet. Uh, so what are the challenges? Uh, okay, what should be the Bayesian network uh, structure of the Bayesian network? We already decided that. I have decided that in, in advance. How should we learn these parameters? Okay, that's a good question. We figure out this throughout the, the lesson. All right, so naive base for digits. We are starting from, from, from this other problem now. So we assume that all the features are independent, meaning all the effects are independent. 
of the specific calls or the specific label. So given that I have a specific digit, all the pixels are independent. Well, it's not true, but we're going to be using that specific uh, assumption. Why the case is going to simplify a lot of things. Uh, simple digit recognition uh, version. So one feature uh, variable, for example, is going to be this feature IJ for each grid uh, position IJ. So FIJ represents the pixel uh, value for the specific location. Um, so the feature values are either on or off. We said before it was binary, uh, Boolean, based on whether its intensity is more or less than 0.5. So in this case, we have that this one digit will have a vector of a specific number of features, which is going to be, for example, 0, 0, for, for like we have black in the top two uh, items. The third item is going to be a one, then we add another one. So we have the, the top of the one, and then all of the other are going to be some zero, then second row, and so on, right? Let me see. This might be a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. But could you explain how the label is the cause and the pixels are the effect? I thought we gave the label given the pixel, which seemed to suggest the other way around. Right. So if I say draw number three, so the cause, the, the, what I'm asking is number three, like the concept, the concept is number three. Then this concept has a representation in, a, let's say, in, a, in a Arabic numbers. It's going to be draw like that, right? If I ask you draw number three in, a, in Chinese or in Japanese, you're going to have the three lines, right? So again, one thing is the cause, the, the idea, let's say, and then the other one is going to be how it's going to be implemented, the specific effect, given that you choose a specific, in this case, uh, vocabulary for number representation. Does it make sense? So each number will have a specific manifestation, if you want, right? One, one concept and then all the uh, features down, like all the, in this case, pixels that are representing whether a specific location was brighter or uh, darker than 0.5. Um, does intensity mean how black a pixel is? Yes. So black means zero, one means um, bright. Well, in this case, it actually is flipped here, right? In this case, uh, this digit is white, so again, the zero is meaning it's 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 like uh, no information, like it's uh, zero zero, like white. Then you have the some dark region, and then again zero zero, uh, because again they are flipped in this in this uh, specific case. So you have all ones for the ones, and then everything is zero over here, right? Since each number can be written in many different ways due to human variation, uh, that means the effect could vary quite highly despite having the same concept. That is correct. And that's why we need learning. So if we were uh, like computer vision, try a long time to actually create some sort of, uh, you know, mathematical way of expressing uh, reality and it doesn't really work. Instead, what we're going to be uh, learning about, especially in a, in a few weeks, which is like our convolutional neural networks are the best approach for uh, learning a invariant representation for all these variabilities, right? So if you learn uh, a invariant representation means, uh, although you might have different ways of drawing a two, the network will learn that all these possible representations, like all possible variations of the pixels uh, mean a specific concept, okay? And we see that basically, again, uh, learning, we said that we are gonna be acquiring knowledge through no deduction, but what did I say? What did we say? We acquire knowledge for learning. That was previous deck of slide, the black things. There are two ways you can induction. Very good, right? So you observe very many different types of uh, variabilities. And then after a bit, uh, you collect all these type of variability in one bucket. And so what uh, learning means is that you will build some invariance for some specific type of variations, OK? And this is very, 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 very pretty because again, you again as I will show you later on how these neural networks perform this uh, this 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 um, invariance. Uh, it's fascinating, I think. But before getting there, which is kind of uh, a bit too far in the future, we actually we have to understand how 
more simplistic things work, okay? Such that we can get there step by step and we don't do uh, too big of a jump. Otherwise, we, we might get lost on the way. So let's keep moving forward, but thank you for the question. Uh, so these are my features. And then uh, there are a lot of features, right? In this case, a lot of binary features. And there's going to be some variability we have to basically somehow take care of. But again, in this case, we'll... Okay, since there is variability, what are we going to be using, right? We don't have exact knowledge. Uh, you cannot say if... Well, you could say, but it's going to be a disaster. Uh, if this specific combination, then... One, if this specific combination, then two. If this specific combination, then I have to list them all, right? Uh, then I have to create how many possible things, how many pixels do I have? In this case, there are 15 uh, times 15, so I have 15 square features. How many uh, possible values are this uh, this vector with 15 square binary feature has? Is it English? Yes. How many possible value can this 15 square dimensional vector have 15 to 25 2 to the 2 yeah <clears throat> i don't know if that's a smiling face but yes uh 2 2 to the power of 225 that <clears throat> that number is big so possibly you can create some sort of boolean expression that is telling you all the the, 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 the like the table the, the the truth table but it's too too large right and so if we also, you have to possibly observe every possible variation of the, of the, you have to observe all of them, right? And that, that's too much data. You don't have two to the power of 225 data. And, you know, it's, it's too painful. Instead, we are going to be just observing a few of these things. So, so since we have just a few, then we're going to be using the probabilistic approach, which is allowing us to have this degree of belief that a specific number is a specific uh, digit. I'm not sure, I'm not certain, but I'm 0 0.9, 99, 95%, 90% uh, sure that's a number one, okay? So as long as my belief that that digit, this digit is larger than all the other digits, then I can actually still say it's a one, right? Although I'm not 100% sure, but let's say I'm 50% sure, and then all the other uh, point. 0, 0.5 probability distributed across the other digits, right? Since we don't have exact knowledge, we can just use this degree of belief. That's why I'm putting all together the concept we just learned about. All right, so a lot of values. And this is like a graphical model we haven't talked about. So I just show you, but if it doesn't make any sense, it's all right, don't worry. So what does this naive base model says? It says that the probability uh, and this P should be bold because uh, Y is a vector. Uh, sorry. So again, base, base model tells us that this, uh, okay, two things going on here. Uh, okay, if, if, you, if you believe that this is like a, a comma, if you, you can say that the full joint and not the conditional, the full joint is given to us by the product of the posteriors of the conditionals. And then, we had this symbol that represents the proportionality because we haven't uh, divided by the uh, prior. Okay, let's forget about this. Y is just the digit label. Yes, and Y can take uh, ten different. Um, y, y can take ten different values, right? So whenever we have capital Y, capital Y is a random variable, and therefore, again, in our textbook, we usually represent. Uh, this letter in bold to show that is a vector of 10 possible probability values. Anyway, uh, this formula is too, too many things going on. Let's forget about this. So what do we do to learn, right? Okay, let's figure out what do we do. So here we have this P of Y. And again, sorry, this is bold. My, my bad. It's bothering me. See, people with OCD and problems. Package PM. Yeah, there we go. Now it looks correct to me. So we have here, uh, this is a bold uh, P. Again, this is the notation our textbook uses because this is a vector of probabilities. Uh, given that this capital Y is a random variable that can take 10 different values, then the, our textbook represents this with a bold P, okay? Uh, meaning 
is going to give us a probability of y uh, being true of equal 0.1 for number one, 0.1 for two, 0.1 for three, and so on, right? So we have a probability mass that is equally distributed uh, across 10 different uh, classes, okay? So question uh, for the student, just to make sure I understand, what is the probability, this uh, prior probability for observing digit three? Point one. Question, what is the prior probability of not observing digit three? Point nine, okay, we understand, very good, sweet, okay. Uh, here we're going to be looking at feature uh, F31 equal on. Again, since this is a vector, this P should be bold. I will fix this notation by the time I put these slides online. So again, here I have a vector of probability for this specific um, pixel. So this is the pixel 31. One, two, no, it's not even 31. Okay, because we start at zero. Zero, one, two, three and then zero one, okay? So this is my pixel uh, three one, the feature uh, three one equal on, okay? So in this case, which uh, given that I observe the specific, uh, the specific digit. So in this case, we should look at the table line, the third line, right? Because given that, okay, we know because we are humans, we can figure out this is a three. So given that this is a, a three, then what is the probability uh, that this pixel is going to be black is going to be 0 0.05, okay? It's very unlikely that for a three, this point here is going to be a black thing, okay? What is, again, the probability of non being black? The other way around, right? 0 0.95. And this is, again, for the specific three. Okay, sweet. Uh, how about for a different... Uh, value, right? What is the probability probability that this pixel is on? Well, now for number three, it's much larger, you can see. So in this case, you expect this pixel to be on for the three, for the four, for the five. Uh, you are expecting this pixel to be on, for example, for the five, for the six, for the, for the zero, right? If you write a zero, it's likely that this pixel is going to be uh, activated. And so we're going to be having a lot of numbers in many tables, right? How many tables do we have here in total? So first of all, each of these number represent the probability of being on, and therefore we can also compute the probability of being off by subtracting this number uh, from one. But again, how many tables do I have for my picture, which we said it was 15? This is not 15, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but anyway, believe this is a 15 times 15 uh, grid. How many tables do I, I need in total? So I have 225 tables. And then also we need 10 uh, additional uh, value, right? For these guys on the left hand side. Okay. So let's see what we can do now. So, okay, now the formula is correct. The general naive base works in the following. We have that this joint probability, again, it's a capital bold letter because again, these are all uh, taking possi multiple possible values, is going to be equal the product of all the conditional, uh, all this conditional probability for each pixel independently multiply, given that you observe the specific uh, digit, and then multiply by the, uh, the prior, okay? So on the left-hand side, we have a total of 10 times two to the 225, right? So these bars means how many values the random variable take. So the Y we said takes 10, 10 values. And then F is a binary variable. Therefore, this is going to be two. It takes two possible values. And then two to the power of N, N we said is 225. So in total, we have 10 times two to the 225 values. There's a lot of numbers. On the other side, on the right side of the equality, instead, we have just, this is 10, which is one value for each of the digits. This is gonna be the fact that I have uh, two numbers. Again, here we can consider one if you just consider a positive number. And then N is going to be, again, the 225, which is the total number of features, right? So for every feature, I will have two possible value, either on or off. 
And then this one happens for each of the possible number of classes we have, okay? And finally, we have this left table uh, that is, again, the 10 different numbers in our case. Okay, no one complains and I'm moving forward. <laughs> All right, so we only had to specify uh, how each feature uh, depends on the class, okay? And that's why it's very convenient, this uh, naive base. Uh, also, the total number of parameters now is linear in n, whereas, whereas on the left-hand side, it was no, it was an exponential, right? Uh, the model is very simplistic, but somehow it actually works. So let's figure out how, what is the procedure for doing this naive base, uh, and then uh, we're going to be restarting from here on Wednesday. So the first part uh, is going to be computing the posterior distribution over the label Y, okay? So the how do we compute the posterior distribution? So first, we start with the full joint. The full joint, we said before, acts as this knowledge, uh, knowledge base for this probabilistic agent. And so here we have this P of Y and then all the features, okay? It is going to be a vector of uh, joints for like y1, y2, y3 until the whatever, uh, like the tenth digit. So these features are my evidence. I observe a specific uh, digit, right? So I know the combination of on and off. I can come up with these uh, ten possible values if we are considering this uh, digit classification case. How do we compute this joint? Right? These joint are this. Uh, very many, uh, they have so many parameters, but we can use the um, naive Bayes approach, meaning we just have to multiply all the probability of all possible features uh, for given that I am observing class one, and then I multiply by the prior for class one. Again, for class two, I multiply all those probabilities for the second row of all the different features, and then multiply by the prior and so on, okay? So finally, once I have multiplied all these numbers together, I will have the joint uh, probability. Now, if I'd like to compute the posterior, how can I compute the posterior, uh, this conditional, uh, if I have the full joint? Remember, I show you the formula on the well, two slides before and also in the black deck of slides. Over here, I have the full joint, which is this probability with all the variables, okay? And we can compute this by assuming the independence of the features as this multiplication of conditional, right? Given that you observe the specific uh, case, right, whatever class you are in, you just multiply the probability of uh, the features. Now that I have this full joint, how can I compute, let's say, Maybe let's say, that how do I compute out of, out of this full joint the marginal? I'd like to marginalize out the, uh, the Y. How can I do that? If you have a probability distribution with multiple variables, how can you remove a variable? That's a question for the students. If students are supposed to type the answer in the chat, if they are understanding the question. Students, <laughs> I know it's five minutes left. Three minutes. I know we did it, but I forgot. Okay, that, that's fair. So if you have the full uh, probability, the full joint probability, and if you want to remove one of the variable, we are basically, you would like, you just sum all the possible uh, values that this variable can take. So if you take all these uh, numbers here, okay, you have these, these things are numbers, right? This is a number, this is a number, this is a number, and so on. If you sum up all of these things, you end up with this thing here, okay? So this is the marginal. It's in the marginal probability of observing just the features. So if you sum all the possible uh, values a random value would take, right? If you sum the probability for one variable to take all possible values, then you end up with the marginal, okay? And then once we have this marginal, but I guess we restart from here uh, Wednesday. Once I have the marginal, I can do interesting things, right? Because I can take the joint, I can divide it by the marginal, I can get the conditional, the posterior, okay? We'll restart from here, I guess, on uh, on, on Wednesday because I, I see that we might have forgotten. So I will create one more slide for uh, 
reminding us how this marginalization works. And then we're going to be seeing how we're going to be doing these calculations concretely uh, with some actual probabilities for the two cases of um, spam detection and the digit classification. All right. So I think that was pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, that's well, all I love to say today. Uh, thanks for pointing out things that we forgot such that I can actually create slides on purpose. Again, this is uh, the first time I'm teaching this course. So every time you have questions and we are a bit, uh, you know, not entirely sure how this works, I can create new material and I will try to uh, help, you know, re remembering what we forgot and what is not too much clear. Okay. Uh, okay, sweet. But again, th that's a good point, right? So you can ask, you can request uh, anything, right, from, from from me. You want me to talk about some specific things? I will create uh, some some slides. All right. So thanks very much for for paying attention. I see you in uh, two days. Okay. Thanks so much. I see you on Wednesday. Bye bye.